Here's another view of the same cathedral. You can see these statues a little bit better here. Now this is an interior view of that rose window at Notre Dame Cathedral. And you'll notice the heavy prevalence of blue and red. Not much in the way of green. Green was tougher to create. And the yellow here may have been the use of a stain, a silver nitrate stain. But you see here, mapped out in delicate little pieces of glass with various pieces of lead came in between them, pictures, pictures of personages. And it's not intended that they're necessarily very realistic. The coloring certainly isn't. It's just intended, once again, to have them represented in a pose that is reminiscent of some Bible story. These very heavy, dark areas here are stone, and in the exercise you did earlier, you figured out how this might have been laid out by the architects with simple tools in such a regular way. Here's the exterior of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, and you'll notice here it's really kind of funny. It's almost as if you, if you've ever carved up a chicken or a turkey, uh, let's say a turkey on uh, Thanksgiving Day, you might have seen something similar with ribs like this. Well, these certainly aren't ribs. These are called flying buttresses. And what they're doing here is making it possible for the windows to occupy so much space in the walls. These things are pressing against the walls where the columns are. And the fact that they're here and supported at the end with a lot of stone, a heavy mass of stone, means that the pressure of those walls trying to spread is resisted by these buttresses. But the fact that they're rather light means they don't block very much light. So you don't tend to see shadows of these on the inside of the church. Now the church wall is here, and it extends down this way. So all of this external support may make the outside of the church look a little bit strange. The inside is rather narrow, but you get the effect inside that the walls are opened up. They don't have to be solid walls. This is what's making it possible for the walls to be opened up in that way. And here is another stained glass window, not the rose window, but once again you see all of these panes here, each with a different figure. And yet again, the green is rather rare, tougher to create that, but the reds and the blues predominate very heavily. Now here's me, when I didn't weigh as much as I do at the present time, standing in front of Notre Dame, and I just thought I'd include the picture and a different view here of these flying buttresses. You can't see it too well on here, but these are actually arches. And at the end of this lecture, I'll show you some illustrations of how these were created, because don't forget, this was still an era when they didn't have structural steel. Everything here had to be constructed of stone, and even these long members that reached up and push against the walls had to be constructed of indi individual stones and to make that sort of a member it would have to be an arch. Now here's the front door, one of the front doors of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and you'll notice this tympanum here has once again figures on it. Actually these are all figures too, rather small, and here's the pictures of these saints and perhaps the apostles. They don't have necessarily any signs under them indicating who's who. They have in their hands something that might identify them. Let's see if we can find an interesting one. Oh, let me see. Probably not here. I was looking for a saint who lost his head. We won't see him at this door. Ah, but we do see him here. What in the dickens is going on here? Well, this is a pretty extreme example of the way the saint was identified. Of course, we don't know what their faces really were. There were no pictures made at biblical times, and we really don't know what these people looked like. But we do know that this saint was martyred by having his head chopped off. So he's standing here holding his head. I don't think he ever really did that in real life, but it's a way that the statue is identified, telling the story to somebody who couldn't read about it. And we'll see that in paintings of subsequent eras, where the identity of a person is revealed by something connected with, typically in a church painting, with their martyrdom. Once again, these decorative pointed arches here. Now this is another very ornate door in a different cathedral. This one is Chartres. Here we have pointed 
arches and this reminiscent here of earlier architectural forms of straight roof. But look at the many, many layers here of decoration heading towards the door. And this tympanum here that has once again these figures on it. And you see the same types of figures of saints here. A little hard to see it in this one. By the way, these are the kinds of doors that you had earlier seen a panel uh, from one of these doors. We'll see some other examples of that. These are plain doors, but in many cases these doors were decorated with panels, each of which had a picture depicting some biblical scene. And this is an illustration, once again, at Chart that shows some of the figures near the front doors. And in this case, we can see here, what is this tablet? Rather small. Well, this must be Moses carrying one of the tablets that the Ten Commandments were on. Now, Here's another cathedral. This is the tympanum of the uh, church at uh, Strasbourg Cathedral in Germany. Interesting thing about this, what we're going to look at here is the development of more realism here as we're moving into the 13th century. But once again, a lot of symmetry here. We have here Jesus in the middle. This is Mary. This is Mary Magdalene. And here's two of the apostles, and here's the remaining apostles, the heads are spaced kind of evenly around and spread out in a symmetrical way. The faces really at this point are no different from one another. They're in a slightly different position, but if you compare them, it really is the same face because it didn't matter what the faces were. Some gestures going on here. This business of putting the hand up to the face was kind of body language for mourning. And I think there's even one other who has his hand up to his face. Is it this person perhaps here? But we also see some style creeping in here and some artistry that wasn't present in earlier times with this sort of architecture in the Middle Ages. What we see here is this drapery being arranged in a very fine way, reminiscent of the way the Greeks had shown the outline of the body under the draped cloth. And the way that this is being draped, it's pretty obvious this was done with some real attention to the way things really would appear. Let's take a look here at another element that very seems very, very interesting. The way that these are posed, rather rigid back here in terms of symmetry. But take a look at the sweep of this arm here, and this arm, and then this curve here. Just about like a kind of a shallow W. And also the very graceful way that these... This body is curved here. This is distinctly different than earlier church art of the Middle Ages that was rather stiff. The artistry wasn't present because it didn't have to be. Here it appears that the people creating this are, well, we might say attempting to push the edge of the envelope here a bit, by introducing a degree of artistry that isn't strictly necessary for the telling of the story. But it does add visual interest. It was something that they really knew how to do, were perhaps early in earlier times thinking it wasn't a necessary thing, but in this case it seemed desirable. And it's part of a movement that eventually results in a rationalization in the Renaissance that realism, making it look like your eye sees it, is a good thing because the more realistic it is, the more the viewer can imagine actually being present. That it makes the scene that's being acted out much more than just a reminder of the story, but it draws the viewer into it, which was one of the driving forces of the pursuit of realism in the Renaissance.